A beautiful fall day in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The sun is shining brightly and the temperature a rather mild 39 degrees for the middle of November. But of course in Minnesota that makes no difference because here they play their pro football inside the climate controlled Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome, home of the Vikings. The Vikings have been one of the NFL's surprise teams in 1986. Under first-year head coach Jerry Burns, Minnesota has posted a 6-4 record, including impressive wins over the Bears and the 49ers. But the Vikings have lost two of their last three, and in both of those losses, they had the lead in the second half. Today's game against the New York Giants looms as the Vikings' biggest of the season. A victory and the Vikes established themselves as legitimate playoff contenders. A defeat? Well, quarterback Tommy Kramer does not think in terms of losing. The veteran Kramer is enjoying the finest season of his 10-year career. Something that cannot be said of his counterpart, Giants quarterback Phil Simms. Sims has had his difficulties in recent weeks, but the Giants have been able to win anyway. The Giants' 8-2 record and first place tie in the tough NFC East is a tribute to the running of Joe Morris and a defense led by Lawrence Taylor. Taylor has returned once again as the NFL's most dominant defender, leading the league in sacks, and he and his playmates will present a big problem for Kramer and the Minnesota offense. From the Metrodome, it's the Minnesota Vikings hosting the New York Giants on the NFL Game of the Week. Not many people would dispute the fact that the Giants have one of the best defenses in all of pro football. Entering this Week 11 matchup with Minnesota, the Giants led the NFC in rushing defense, allowing the fewest yards on the ground of any team in the conference and they led the entire NFL in quarterback sacks. On Minnesota's first offensive possession, they showed the Vikings why they are number one in both categories. But the Vikings proved that they could dish out a little punishment as well, as their defense put a hurting on Giants wide receiver Stacy Robinson deep in Minnesota territory. The Giants had the game's initial opportunity to get into the end zone, but this Phil Sims to Joe Morris strike sailed through Morris's hands, and New York was denied the early touchdown. Midway through the first quarter, the Giants settled for this 41-yard field goal by Raul Alegre, and they went ahead 3 to nothing. It was the beginning of a busy day for Alegre, a day that would not end until the game's final seconds. Meanwhile, the Giants' defense continued to pressure and frustrate Tommy Kramer. Kramer, the NFC's most productive quarterback this season, could not generate much offense with the pass. So he tried the quick feet of his halfback, Darren Nelson, number 20. Nelson's quick burst through and around the Giants' defense helped set up the game-tying field goal of 39 yards by his namesake, Chuck Nelson. Two long drives, one by the Giants and one by Minnesota, had consumed most of the first quarter. The result was a swap of field goals. With a minute left in the period, the Giants began their second drive of the game. This one featured their most potent offensive weapon, Joe Morris, first as a receiver and then in his more customary role as one of the NFL's finest runners.
Morris's 15-yard run took the ball inside the Minnesota 20. But on a key third down play, the Vikings defense responded, producing this sack by defensive end Mark Mullaney, number 77. Mulaney's big defensive play forced the Giants to kick another field goal. And Raul Alegre drilled home his second of the game, this one from 37 yards. Early in the second quarter, the Giants led Minnesota 6-3. The yards were many, the points few. Viking fans knew how important this game was to a team that has swallowed hard in two of the last three weeks, losing heartbreaking struggles to the Redskins and Browns. Minnesota had proved they could compete. Now they had to prove they could win. The Giants' defense did not seem willing to oblige. When Nelson was shut down, Kramer finally got the Vikings' passing game going. First going to his vastly underrated tight end, Steve Jordan, number 83, for 22 yards. And then nailing swift wide receiver Anthony Carter twice the second for 12 yards, and nearly quite a bit more. Carter's reception gave Minnesota first down at the Giants 22. But the Giants defense, like Minnesota's earlier in the second quarter, rose up to meet the challenge and deny the Vikings the touchdown opportunity. Lawrence Taylor sacked Kramer to add to his league-leading total. And the Vikes had to march out their field goal kicker for the second time in the game. Like Allegra, Chuck Nelson made it two for two. Once again, the game was even, this time at six. It was more than halfway through the second quarter and only 12 total points had been scored. Yet this game was not a defensive battle in the classic sense. Both teams were piling up yards on the ground and in the air and the Giants' ability to do so particularly concerned Minnesota defensive coordinator Floyd Peters. Peters, in his first year with the Vikings, has been responsible for a defensive resurgence in Minnesota, and his troops went out and laid some leather on New York's 1,000-yard runner, Joe Morris. Morris found little room to run against the Vikings' defense, but Minnesota's success in clamping down on Little Joe did not carry over into the passing game. Sims hooked up on two consecutive plays with the NFC's leading tight end, Mark Bavaro, number 89. Each reception good for 25 yards. Lo and behold, the Giants could not get into the end zone. Their third impressive drive of the first half ended with their third field goal of the first half. Raul Alegre had booted number three, and the Giants went back in front, nine to six. Well, now it would be Minnesota's turn. If all went according to script, the Vikings would impressively march down the field, beautifully mixing run and pass. And then they would grudgingly settle for a field goal. They followed that scenario to the letter, almost. Aaron Nelson darted through the Giants' defense for two big first down runs. But of course, as the Vikings approached the New York end zone, their drive gradually slowed down until it petered out completely. But we knew that was going to happen, didn't we? Time once again for three points in Chuck Nelson. But this time, Nelson missed, upsetting the balance of the precisely orchestrated first half of field goal after field goal. So the Giants would go to the locker room with a precarious 9-6 advantage, and the Vikings would be haunted by Nelson's miss.
At halftime, the Vikings honored their all-time leading passer, Hall of Famer Fran Tarkenton. Then it was time for Sir Francis's successor to draw a few accolades himself. As the third quarter began, the man who followed this legend, Tommy Kramer, put together a scoring drive as well executed as any Tarkenton might have crafted. Kramer showed a flair for foolery with his sleight of hand. But he wasn't the only Viking on the field blessed with talented fingers, as a key grab by halfback Darren Nelson bore out. Nelson's circus catch was ruled complete, and then Kramer polished off a most stylish 11-play drive with an easy scoring flip to wide-open fullback Alan Rice, number 36. Rice's touchdown broke the string of field goals that had dominated the game and gave the Vikings their first lead of the afternoon. Minnesota's backs had been most productive on this first touchdown march of the day, and now they felt it was important to make sure New York's runners did not produce a similar performance. That meant stopping Joe Morris, hardly an easy task. In each of his last four games, little Joe had rushed for over 100 yards or more. But that century mark streak would end today against the determined Vikings running defense. Morris did reach one milestone. He raised his seasonal total over the 1,000-yard mark for the second straight year. But his game output was a paltry 49 yards, a very un-Morris-like effort. The whole New York offense struggled through the third quarter, with their biggest gain coming not by the run or pass, but by an interference call. Number 30, cornerback Isaac Holt had two pass thefts in this game against the Giants, but this time his penalty was most damaging. It set up Raul Alegre's fourth field goal of the game, trimming the Viking lead to a single point. The Giants seemed to regain their equilibrium with the score and shook off any damage caused from the earlier Minnesota touchdown they had allowed. Since the offense was struggling, it meant the defense would have to assert itself. In New York, the D has been doing this all year, especially against the run. They ranked first in the conference in that category, and the Viking backs were about to see just why the men of the Meadowlands had earned such lofty status. Minnesota was held in check for the rest of the third quarter, but that took on secondary importance as the fourth quarter began. The Vikes lost not only possession, but their quarterback and spiritual leader as well. Tommy Kramer had jammed his thumb and would not return to action for the rest of the game. The NFC's second leading passer was gone, and a seldom used replacement was about to be thrown into the pit against one of the NFL's most terrifying defenses. At this point in the game, the Vikings would have vastly preferred to take on the roly-poly Pillsbury Doughboy instead of the hard-as-nails giant defense. No doubt New York was cooking up a mean batch of trouble for Minnesota. But for the moment, the Giants were treating the football like a scalding tray of hot biscuits. The 
giants somehow salvage the play, then return to a far more proficient form of travel with a slick reverse by wide receiver Bobby Johnson. Number 88. On the very next play, Phil Simms and Johnson finished off the drive with a pass that produced New York's first and only touchdown of the game. The key to the success of the score was Simms' play-action fake to Joe Morris. Minnesota hesitated, and that split second of indecision made it easy for Johnson to haul in his fourth touchdown grab of the year. Things were looking pretty rosy for the New Yorkers. They had regained the lead and now were going up against reserve quarterback Wade Wilson, who had attempted all of six passes this season. But Wilson is one of the league's better relief pitchers, having bailed the Vikings out on several occasions in the past. And he proved to be more than able this time too, completing the first three tosses on his initial drive. Vikings quickly moved to the Giants 33, where Wilson promptly finished off the series with a scoring pass to Anthony Carter, number 81. Although Carter was happy with the score, he wasn't too thrilled with defensive back Perry Williams and his four-point landing at the conclusion of the play. Despite little Anthony's imperial protest, the refs ruled that no late hit had occurred. The bottom line was that Wade Wilson had done yeoman service, moving the Vikes in for a score in less than three minutes. And with Anthony Carter's fifth touchdown reception of the season, Minnesota had the lead with under seven minutes to play. Although Carter was most displeased at the end of the touchdown, the rest of the Vikings' temperament was just the opposite. They went out and held the Giants, getting the ball back with under four minutes to go. But Minnesota couldn't budge either. So with two minutes on the clock, New York had one last chance to pull out a victory. And Phil Simms tried to earn that win on a single play. Number 81, Stacy Robinson just missed holding on to what would have been a huge game. So Simms returned to short tosses. And with Minnesota playing to avoid the long one, the underneath yardage was there for the taking. But on a critical third down play, the Vikings' Doug Martin stormed in and sacked Sims for a nine yard loss. Things looked very bleak for the Giants and most promising for Minnesota. Barely a minute remained, New York was down to its last play. Everyone in the state of Minnesota knew a pass was coming. Viking defensive coordinator Floyd Peters signaled in the coverage he wanted. If the Norsemen held here, the game would be theirs. But then Phil Simms made his biggest completion of the day, and in doing so, kept New York's flickering hopes alive. Once again, it was Bobby Johnson to the rescue with a clutch 22-yard grab. Now all the Giants wanted was to move the ball in a bit closer for the winning field goal. And two Joe Morris runs accomplished that. The familiar form of Raul Alegre was then summoned to the scene. And for the fifth time, he came through. A 33-yard boot that gave the Giants their ninth victory of the season. The 22-20 win puts the Giants at 9-2 and, and keeps them in first place in the fiercely competitive NFC East. There were many heroes in this game. Allegre in his five clutch kicks, Phil Simms in his 300-plus yards passing, and a bag full of important plays for Bobby Johnson. With the tough Broncos, 49ers, and Redskins coming up in the next three weeks, New York badly needed this game and got it. 
Best of all for the Giants was that it came on the road against a tough team. And when matters seemed their worst, they somehow came through and won. When you come from behind and win in the last seconds, well, that is the mark of a championship team, a title the New York Giants seemed quite capable of making their own.